Welcome everyone. Uh, we're excited to, uh, to have you today. My name is uh, Mohamed, uh, the managing partner at Radian Partners, uh, management consulting firm focused on strategic communications research. Uh, this is the ongoing video series for the Institute for Public Relations Measurement Commission, where we talk about the past, present, and future of communications research, and specifically what's changing from the measurement standpoint. Today, I'm very excited to have Dr. Joe Sabosky, uh, an assistant professor at UNC, uh, with us today. Hello, Joe. Hey, Mo. Thanks so much uh, for having me today. We're, uh, we're very excited to have you, and, uh, and, and we have a lot to talk about from, uh, from, from the obvious circumstances surrounding COVID and, of course, uh, you know, the impact that this will have from a communications research standpoint. Um, so shall we jump right in, Joe? Yeah. Let's go for it. Excellent. I think we should start, Joe, by talking a little bit about your, your background because um, it's, a, it's a particularly interesting one and, and I think a lot of folks at the Institute um, have, uh, have just been very intrigued about the, uh, the sort of diversity of, of thinking that you bring. So, so let's start there. Yeah. Um, you know, so professionally, I have, um, I got a mix of degrees over the years. So my my education and then career started in Los Angeles. I actually got a, a BFA of all things uh, from, a, uh, it was kind of a media school, but um, small school called Chapman just outside of LA in Orange County. Um, it very entertainment focused, film focused, um, but I kind of had an all inclusive uh, media degree in many, many ways. Um, and then, so I started in development uh, in the entertainment industry. Um, folks on the West Coast know that development can mean many things and nothing all at the same time, depending on, on where you're working at and what you're doing. Um, but for me, it was great because it, it got me involved in everything from understanding, uh, you know, product development, creative development, um, definitely more on the, on the creative side. Um, I got more into PR uh, in that position from very LA kind of things like, um, you know, Hollywood fundraisers to uh, red carpet events, you know, especially on the event and creative planning side. Um, there's also just a lot of internal relations, internal man management on a lot of those projects. Um, and, I, and I got really interested in research even, even when I was in more of those creative roles uh, because of, you know, things like box office analysis and not just, uh, you know, things, things on the financial side in terms of internal budgeting but then also audience development in particular. And, uh, you know, I was there at a time when the industry was really um, uh, changing a little bit to include more and more diverse audiences where things could be more at a, a niche or micro level. And I always remember being, uh, you know, kind of interested in that space at that time. Um, the, the summary from there is uh, I left during, there was a huge writer strike. I'm dating myself now, but uh, in LA that, that generally shuts down everything. Uh, and that's a good time. Uh, I remember my boss at the time told me, uh, now is the time to go and get, you know, that grad degree that gets you where you want. So think about the people that have the jobs that you want, you know, and go and, and follow their path a little bit. And they all either had uh, MBAs or JDs. Um, uh, on the way to, uh, eventually I went to law school, and we can talk about that. Um, on the way there, I, uh, I worked at a boutique uh, for a while while the industry was kind of shut down. I moved to uh, Dallas with a boutique PR and ad agency, um, uh, then worked on a presidential campaign at the time doing a lot of community relations work, which was definitely a new um, kind of a new landscape that just was perfect for that temporary time between leaving LA and law school. And uh, so then I got a law degree uh, at Michigan State and then I kept moving east and south from there. Um, there was a fellowship opportunity to get a doctorate here at the School of Media uh, and Journalism at the time uh, at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, and so since getting a doctorate here as a, a fellow years ago, um, I've been here, oh, I guess about just wrapped up my fifth year as an assistant professor uh, at the university uh, within the public relations track. Wow. Well, what a journey you've had, Joe. And, uh, and, and certainly uh, we're, we're very excited to have you as uh, one of the newest members of uh, IPR's Measurement Commission. Uh, so as part of that, uh, Joe will be contributing uh, to uh, the, the huge body of knowledge that we're building at IPR around 
essentially what we call the, the science beneath the art of, of public relations. So we're very excited to have you in that capacity, Joe. So I'm sure many, many folks that are listening are wondering, how does, you know, being a sort of a JD turned, you know, prof in, in communications, you know, what's that journey like? And, and, you know, did that journey sort of result in you focusing on specific research topics? Maybe you can talk a little bit about your areas of interest and, and how that's evolved over time. Yeah, so, you know, in a nutshell, I, I view a JD as um, a strategy degree. Um, and I think a lot of people in public relations naturally find a blend with a, a JD. Um, as I kind of mentioned, uh, it, it was almost happenstance when I decided on it. Um, again, it was, it was just the crazy world of, of living in a shutdown in LA. And that's the time when, you know, you either go on vacation for a year or, or go and try to advance your, your career in a different way. And um, like I said, I thought a lot about an MBA, you know, getting a more advanced degree in marketing or, or JD. I guess I was just more curious about a JD. Um, there are a lot of people that were in either PR or management within Los Angeles at the time that I thought it, they were practicing lawyers by day, though they were licensed attorneys. Um, and I just thought that that was more of, a, of an interesting path. So they just kind of went down that route and um, Michigan State gave me a generous offer and it kind of just went from there. Um, and, I, and I never really thought that I would use it in, in the fully, you know, as a fully practicing attorney. Um, but I remembered, uh, you know, early on in, in my first semester, even in, in law school way back when, just thinking these are the same, these are the same rules and principles of public relations. You know, it's about understanding the research in, in law that's, that's knowing everything. <laughs> you know, literally, it's not practice if you don't. Um, but then the rest is, is storytelling coupled with knowing your audience. And I remember being just fascinated with, you know, you read casebook after casebook. The law is always theoretically the same. And they'll always ask you, okay, here is this case in this year in this town. Here is this case in this year in this town. They came out very differently. Why is that? And you think to yourself, the lawyers, you know, the two lawyers that were involved, or the judge that's involved, or if there's a jury that's involved, um, and the way that those stories are communicated, or those relationships that are built, or even just something that's as simple as the understanding of a town, you know, where that where that trial was held. And so. My career to me, I've, I've kind of back-ended into research in terms of I started, like I said, on the BFA side, on the creative side, and it really helped me. You know, I started my career on the, the implementation of creative ideas, the creative strategy within PR or advertising, marketing. The law degree was that kind of middle section of strategy. Um, you know, and then I got my doctorate, which is a research-focused um, area. And so, like I said, though, even when I was on the creative side, I was always curious in terms of the audiences that weren't being paid attention to, I thought, or the audiences that were often misunderstood. Um, and so I think naturally I was always research oriented within the space of, of PR and, and media analysis. Um, and so I, you know, I'm kind of on that line of going from, again, creative to strategy back back to research and that's what I that's what I like most about my job is these days I'm a I'm a metrics wonk I'm a, an audience measurement kind of wonk by day but it's nice to be able to then connect that in a very approachable way hopefully with clients industry trade groups to say here's why you have to understand the data but also here's what you get to do with it and and I think that's often a challenge is you know many of us can be uh, the data nerds or the data wonks and many of us um, are the, the creative folks, and it's often sometimes feels like we're talking two different languages. Um, and so I've always enjoyed kind of being able to be a, a bridge, if you will, between those, you know, those two uh, hats within our industry. Sure, sure. And certainly, you know, we, we hear a lot about this kind of a common set of themes in terms of communications and public relations research, um, a big one being ROI uh, and, and how to measure the ROI of, of initiatives and, and how the measurement of impact has really evolved over time, uh, time and time again, 
you know, across a variety of different conferences, we see folks still talking about ad equivalencies. We see folks, you know, also trying to create, um, you know, what I would call proprietary means of, of, of measuring impact. We also see, you know, lately a lot of folks in public relations and communications trying to mirror what their counterparts are doing in, in marketing uh, around attribution model and, and, and modeling and, and marketing mix modeling. And I think we won't get to hear this perspective a lot at IPR, so uh, I, I'd love to, to get your perspective on this. Do you think there's a difference between what you know, the corporate community tends to focus on from a measurement standpoint and where the actual research is being conducted in the academic world? And, and what is the disparity, if any? You know, I, I think there are weaknesses on both sides, quite frankly. Um, you know, the, the beauty of, of research on the academic side is that it doesn't have to be sales driven. And I know, especially when you're working, you know, on the research side in industry, there are questions that you often want to ask, but either maybe you don't have the budget for it, or there are definitely times where you want to go down certain rabbit holes and, you know, depending on your boss's or organization or, or accounts, um, that's irrelevant to the client or they don't, you know, they don't want to know about that. And, and so the benefit of the academic side is that we're able to generate that, that knowledge for purely knowledge sake. Um, I think the weakness of the academic side is that a lot of times we've, um, we create the general knowledge, but it doesn't always connect back to the private sector. And, and, and it's not that it's not relevant. I think we often just need to do a better job of making that connection and communicating it uh, to, private, to the private sector. And I think it also just depends on the institutions that are involved. Um, you know, some, in, some institutions are better at um, creating those connections than others. Um, quite literally, it's just a matter of function. Uh, if you are at a purely research university in the sense that that means it's academic knowledge, your job is to produce peer-reviewed academic journals all day, every day. And frankly, they're often just not read by industry. Um, and, they're not, and they're not written in a way that even if industry did want to engage, that I, that I think is frankly always understandable. One of the benefits of, of my job is um, I'm, at a, I'm at a heavy research university. I do research uh, for a living. Um, but my, my position at UNC is actually considered a professional creative position is what my tenure track is. And that's, you know, I admit that's a challenge for a lot of institutions to figure out how do you assess that for, for purposes like tenure, for example. Um, but we are a professionally oriented school. And so like a lot of business schools uh, around the country, um, my job is one of the unique positions within my university to be able to say, okay, how do we translate this in a very applied manner? Um, you know, and I think, uh, I think to your broader question, even beyond ac academia, those are a lot of the challenges that I think the industry still faces as far as things like AVEs. We always say that they're dead, you know, we're, or we're, we've tried to kill them and we know we haven't killed them and they still float out there. But I think the, but I think the AVE mindset is actually a much bigger problem than just AVEs themselves. So in other words, I think we, we all know we're not supposed to use AVEs, or at least most of us do. Um, so even when we get rid of the AVE model, I think many of our measures still apply it that way, mentally. So even if we're not thinking about it in terms of exact equivalency or you know, marketing comparatives, we still often think about, especially output measures, mm -hmm. um, that get kind of stuck at that you know, at, at that point in, in the door or the gateway. And, and we don't think of them necessarily as AVEs, but it's still the same mindset that I think limits us. That's disconnecting still, um, you know, our output measures versus our, our ROI or, or certainly impact measures, which is, I think, what we're all trying to work on uh, of not only justifying what we do, but then also just showing the, the very real impacts of, of what it means for clients in very different ways, depending on the context. Sure. Yeah, it sort of seems as though, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll cite what a mentor of mine in, in PR and, and communications has told me year after year. It's, it's sort of like 
we've been talking about the same things more or less, you know, for the past 50 years in, in, in this space. And, and, and uh, in contrast to a lot of other disciplines like, um, like sales or like engineering or, um, or like finance, um, there is so much entropy or, or disagreement about how to go about things um, in the public relations and communications world, um, especially as it pertains to measurement, um, uh, at least in, 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 in comparison to, to, to other functions that exist in, in the corporate world. And I've always wondered about that. Uh, and uh, at least in this case, my mentor has just uh, sort of said that, um, you know, the, the orientation that communications tends to have as a function is all about obsessing over the details of, of language and how things are positioned towards various different stakeholders, internal and external. Um, and because of that precision around language, um, we oftentimes struggle with uh, building consensus uh, as it pertains to different uh, uh, different standards that we're setting for the industry and, and, and you know, different approaches that we're trying to take even from a measurement standpoint, um, you know, and, uh, because it's kind of like we're, we have this precision orientation. Um, so it's interesting to get your perspective on, you know, how the, the focus in the academic world compares to that of, of the corporate world. So, so thanks for that, Joe. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the elephant in the room, which of course is, is, is COVID-19. I would love to get your perspective on, on things, uh, both from a global standpoint and from a domestic standpoint. You know, we have folks, uh, that are going on TV and 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 uh, you know and are getting covered across mainstream media that basically are talking about a multi-year, not just a recession that we've entered into, but a depression, um, uh, in, in in some cases, and others within the public relations communications uh, world have um, started talking about how uh, this is going to change the way that agencies. Um, sort of work. This is going to change the way in which brands work with their public relations agencies. And some have even started to talk about how uh, COVID-19 will usher in a new era of communications around pandemics or sort of pandemic communications, uh, which has never been really focused before. So what's your take on, on where we are? Are you, are you optimistic or, or, or pessimistic? Um, about uh, about the situation we're facing economically and, and what um, impact do you think this will have on uh, on the function of public relations? You know, I, I'm always an optimist. People that know me well know I'm always the, the optimist in the room. Um, on the economy, that doesn't mean, so even pre-COVID, I would say that I was getting pretty bearish on the economy. Um, just we we're at the longest, you know, bull market of, of any modern day uh, going into the new year as it was. Um, and we were already having these questions about the natural slowdown. Uh, and we already saw it in the European markets uh, uh, as it was. And then, you know, COVID came along and pretty much shut down the world. And in a global economy, of course, we've seen the impacts of that. Um, I guess I'm optimistic in the domestic market. Um, and I and you've seen the cuts in, in PR and marketing more broadly uh, for a lot of corporations. We've seen this in downturns uh, for decades. Um, I think we've always found that it's misguided, but companies do it anyway. Um, it, you know, the companies that kind of spend through a crisis, it's kind of like the way that governments will spend through a crisis to get you through. Um, and a lot of the companies that begin to struggle will cut their PR budgets, cut their, cut their ad or marketing budgets. Um, and then that often accelerates the problem um, versus figuring out a way to be a voice, you know, kind of through the downtime. Um, that said, you know, I'm, I, I guess I'm hopeful of the overall economy um, bouncing back over the next few years. Uh, but then again, I think there's a clear reality that you know, certain sectors will change forever and some jobs will definitely not uh, come back. Uh, I do think some of the biggest challenges within PR, and this I think relates to some of our challenges in measurement, is, is naturally the field really started to come as a profession, as a degree, as a major, 
you know, in a lot of places, not till the 80s even, but, you know, from the 70s and 80s, we often developed as a career and it was, it was, you know, a, a function of a lot of former journalists becoming PR pros. And then we saw that continue to grow into more modern PR of the 80s and the 90s. Um, and then we became into this digital realm, right, in the 2000s and, and certainly 2010s. And, and we, you know, I, I, I was optimistic about where PR measurement was 10 years ago in many ways. I thought we had come a long way. Um, but at the same time, when you look at something like the Barcelona Principles, uh, when they first came out, I think the language was social media can and should be measured, you know, which is quite broad. It, you know, it's, it's like, thanks, you know, so how, what do we do with that? And, and it shows how, how many challenges we've also had to change then of, it, it felt like we had just kind of established ourselves as a field after several decades. And then the field becomes mostly digital, or at least in progress to digital. And, and, and we're already there going into COVID. And now I think COVID has just been that final accelerant. Um, but what that means, I think, back to the economy question is, I think there was potential to have continued growth as was projected in PR in particular over the next decade. If, if anything, I think it's more important than ever. But what we also saw was the, even before COVID on the media relations side of public relations, which I think has always gotten our, the brunt of our attention. Um, it's what a lot of folks outside of PR think are, is what we do and only what we do. And I think sometimes even within PR, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of journalists just assume we are still just press release people for a living, um, even even though that's a small bucket of it. Um, but I but I am concerned, right? We know the continual decline of of news jobs and journalist jobs. At the same time, of we still project even with COVID, and and I, it's definitely disrupted things. But we still project a pretty substantial growth in public relations, corporate communications type positions domestically and globally over the next decade. And I think that emphasizes how the profession is changing a lot. Um, and, and people will have to retrain even within the same profession. But then, you know, that, that probably segues to some of our, our other discussion topics today as far as, well, then what does that mean for measurement as we become less news media related focus, at least on a percentage basis of our jobs. Absolutely, absolutely, and and to that point, Joe, uh, you know, I think one of, one of the aspects that many public relations practitioners are are trying to wrap their heads around is is how you know this 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 current environment will change things from a measurement standpoint. And I'll give you a very specific example. There are, you know, in-house public relations practitioners and agency practitioners that are trying to grapple with the percentage of coverage around brands being dominated by COVID. Um, and of course, you know, if you think about that, just in terms of a percentage of, of mentions, um, you know, that are related to the business side of a, of a particular brand or related to, you know, their involvement with, uh, you know, pandemic related efforts, et cetera it creates a significant challenge in assessing, assessing the penetration of messages, assessing the alignment of different audiences, both internal and external. And I imagine that, you know, if you're trying to do any kinds of reputational benchmarking, this, this creates a significant challenge, um, you know, from a, from a measurement standpoint. So, you know, what, what would you say to folks that are trying to create an approach uh, for public relations measurement uh, in, in today's environment. Are there any lessons that, you know, we've learned about, about how to handle measurement, um, you know, post COVID uh, and, and, and what might those be? You know, I guess two or three things come to mind. The, the first is that, as you were saying, whatever, whatever kind of organization you are, you have to be able to figure out how your own metrics work when there's a lot of noise. Um, and so within that in mind, right, you, everything is relative to the organization. So the half-lives of how long COVID will impact, you know, something like your reputation or be associated with your organization are gonna vary greatly. 
there are going to be certain sectors where in that sector you might be separated from a lot of that COVID noise by June or July. Other sectors such as education or HR related types of public relations or entities that are working from home or certainly healthcare or any kind of emergency services, anything like that, you could see how this kind of noise or, or major global pandemic issue is going to pretty much consume you for not just this year, but maybe the next two years, if not three years, right? And so everything first, I, I guess the point being is you have to figure out what relativity of, of your organization, or if you're working within an agency and you've got different accounts, not treating all of your accounts as the same. Even if you're, all of your accounts are within a certain sector, you know, realizing that all of the different entities are going to be dealing with different timelines as far as how they kind of come out of this noise. And I think that lesson is important e even as we move beyond COVID. You know, it's also it's a presidential election for those in the United States. And there's always noise and there are always difficulties and there are always non-normal uh, things. They are cyclical at every four years. But, you know, if you're comparing your October metrics this year versus your October metrics last year, even without COVID, it's going to be a different kind of environment. And so that's the thing is, you know, I'm all for benchmarks and, and creating those norms. But we're all pretty much in a cycle of there are always disruption points, whether it's an election whether it's hurricane season, depending on your clients, whether it's a pandemic, right, which has pretty much wiped out all of our norms. Um, but, but thinking about it in, in kind of that uh, relative way. I think the other big lesson though from COVID, if we, think about, if we think about some of the flaws in the way we talk about COVID or COVID measures, a lot of those flaws to me are the same kind of flaws that we have in, in traditional PR measurements. And what I mean by that is, we're often, we're often distracted by the shiniest objects or the easiest objects, which means, you know, you've seen a, an, an incredible focus on the number of people with COVID. But we, but we know, and to me, that's almost like our obsession with impressions. Or um, I'm working on a piece right now, just being in the, in the Southeast, we've already had two tropical systems and the system hasn't even, the season hasn't even started yet. And, you know, so it's it, to me that that top line of COVID is kind of like our obsession with wind speed in a hurricane. But in down east North Carolina, where I live, some of our worst hurricanes have been category one hurricanes, mm -hmm. but they've had torrential rains. They've destroyed areas for weeks and weeks and weeks, and they don't get any coverage for it. And, you know, so going back to COVID, again, the problem with that overall metric is, uh, you know, up until this day, what are we at? About two or three percent of the country that's been tested, and and so we're still trying to give an overall assessment based on really only knowing three percent of our audience. That would seem silly in a PR measurement world, um, you know. And, and we get more and more cases, but that's also just because we're doing more and more testing. But then again, if you think about that lesson in terms of all of PR measurement. You know, I think we need to continue to ask ourselves, are our top line measures that try to treat everything in the macro, which is what a lot of clients are obsessed with because we've also trained them to be obsessed with them, I think. Right. Um, is that really the story? Or is the story all of the underlying metrics, uh, you know, that give a lot more depth and nuance to what's really going on, as well as the consideration, are you even talking about either the full audience or the right audience? And that's why even though, you know, all of these COVID measures aren't, aren't public relations related directly, you know, unless you're in the pandemic space or, or healthcare space, the lessons to me are, are the exact same. And they continue to be some of the problems that we have uh, within public relations metrics more generally, where especially I think we focus way too much on, uh, at that macro level. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that perspective, Joe. I think to wrap one of the things that that uh, that we've gotten as a question uh, over and over again in this series is is just about the unknowns, uh, or I should say specifically the uh, you know what we think are the, the 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 known knowns or the unknown unknowns in this case um, as it pertains to public relations uh, you know day to day activity. 
I mean, is there something from a strategy standpoint, something from a um, day-to-day operations standpoint, something from a measurement standpoint that the public relations function or public relations research or measurement is just completely not thinking about that, um, that we need to be thinking about as it pertains to the current environment? Um, what would your perspective be on that, Joe? You know, there are, again, I, there are probably two or three things that stand out to me. The, the least in control are global factors that will just always impact us, whether it's a pandemic like this. Um, but also, you know, I think we're at a, we're, we're recording this on a day where there is conflict between the White House and, and China uh, on growing tensions. And those global factors, I, I think we always have to be prepared for about just what that means for commerce or, or media or entities. But, but the two that really stand out, even, you know, regardless of, of COVID that I think we're already entering into as a decade, and if anything, I think COVID is accelerating. The first being, just think about the year that we've gone through in terms of the, the transformation of media. And it's not just the rise of, you know, you're always going to have a continual rise of of TikTok is a new entity now that we definitely don't have the proper measures for from a corporate perspective. So platforms are always changing, but think about Disney Plus launched this year, Peacock is launching, you know, HBO Max is launching, CBS All Access is changing, Hulu is expanding. And, you know, we were holding on for the last decade to the old model which was the news model, which was, you know, still conventional television, even though we knew it was, the dam was breaking. But we're in an entirely new world where a few huge entities from Netflix to Disney are going to control access to information in a different kind of way, coupled with the big tech giants as far as social media. And so our old models have been breaking for 10 years, but now everything is in place. And then COVID has just accelerated this where does this change the way we have access to data in the first place? You know, all of these entities, Netflix is definitely not nearly as transparent, you know, with their viewing metrics as traditional Nielsen ratings or other things that we might use to, to count. So how, how does even our access to information change over the next few years? How does this just change the, the continual involvement of how people are getting information at all? Um, let alone, especially again, in any kind of news information, especially in any kind of digital or broadcast way. Um, and then related to that, I, I think is the ongoing issues that we have where AI is going to continue to be a major player and will dominate the next decade, as we all know. Um, and somebody at the last IPR Bridge Conference, I think, said it well, where there's, uh, I'm not quoting, quoting them directly, but the disconnect between, you know, kind of the brain and the, uh, and the knowledge of whether it's a, a data nerd or a machine or AI and the heart of a public relations person or the audience that we tried to connect with on the other side of ourselves. And I think that's where it, the, the machines or the data still only tell you so much about people if you don't understand people. And as a profession, I think we're going to have more data than ever, but in some ways we're gonna actually maybe lose some of the access to our data, depending on how these divisions are created within these entities. But all of that data still doesn't mean anything unless we understand people. And so how are, how are we going to be able to connect the machine with the heart and the story that we do it for a living? And, and I don't have the answers with that. And that's where all the unknowns are to me. But I, I do hope that that's where we're paying attention to those, those two challenges or so. Absolutely. Th thanks for sharing your, your perspective, Joe. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's a wrap for today. Um, you know, of course, this is an ongoing series and uh, uh, you know, perspectives like Joe really help to expand this body of knowledge that we're building at, at the Institute for Public Relations. And our, and our goal is, is, is in, in illuminating the science beneath the art of public relations, we want to make content like this more and more accessible. So if you have suggestions on, uh, on topics, on, on, on other interviewees uh, for us to have on the program, uh, please do comment. And, uh, and if you'd like to learn anything more about the research that um, Dr. Joe is doing or that we are doing at the Institute, 
uh, please feel free to reach out to us individually. Uh, you'll see our contact information in the description uh, to this video. Thanks again, everyone. And, and thank you so much, uh, Joe, for, uh, for participating today. Really, really insightful discussion. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Until the next time.